Hello, here we are with chapter four. There we are. Part two. So here we go. We'll be all right, I told Stella. Mum and Dad, they'll come back for us. They're bound to. They will, they will. Mum will get better and they'll come back. She won't leave us here. She'll find us, you'll be see. All we've got to do is keep a lookout for them and stay alive. Water, will need water, but so do those monkeys, right? We've just got to find it, that's all. And there must be food too, fruit or nuts, something. Whatever it is that they eat, we'll eat. It helped to speak my thoughts out loud, Stella, helping to calm the panic that came over me now in waves. More than anything, it was Stella's companionship that helped me through those first hours on the island. It seemed to make sense not to plunge at once into the forest looking for water. To be honest, I was too frightened anyway, but rather to explore the shoreline first. I might come across a stream or river flowing out into the sea, and with a bit of luck on the way, I might well find something I could eat as well. I set off in good spirits, leaping down the scree like a mountain goat. Where monkeys lived, I reasoned, we could live. I kept telling myself that. I soon discovered that the track down through the trees were bereft of all edible vegetation. I did see fruits of sorts, What's, what looked to me like fruit anyway. There were coconuts up there too, but the trees were all impossible to climb. Some rose a hundred feet, some two hundred feet from the forest floor. I had never seen such giant trees before. At least the, the intertwining canopy did provide welcome relief from the heat of the day. All the same, I was becoming desperately parched now, and so was Stella. She padded alongside me all the way, her tongue hanging. She kept giving me baleful looks whenever our eyes met. There was no com comfort I could give her. We found our beach once again and set off round the island, keeping wherever possible to the edge of the forest to the shade. Still, we found no stream again. I, was, I saw plenty of fruit, but always too high, and the trees were always too smooth, too sheer to climb. I found plenty of coconuts on the ground, but always cracked open and empty inside. When the beach petered out, we had to strike off into the forest itself. Here too, I found a narrow track to follow. The forest became impenetrable at this point, dark and menacing. There was no howling any more, but something infinitely more sinister. The shiver of leaves, the cracking of twigs, sudden surreptitious rustlings, and they were near me, all around me, I knew. I was quite sure now that eyes were watching us. We were being followed. I hurried on, swallowing my fear as best I could. I thought of gibbons I had seen back in the zoo and tried to persuade myself how harmless they had looked. They'd leave us alone. They'd never attack us. They weren't man -eaters, but as the rustlings came ever closer, ever more threatening, I found it harder and harder to convince myself. I began to run and I kept running until the track brought us out onto rocks into the blessed light of day and there was the sea again. This end of the island appeared to be littered with massive boulders that lay like tumbled cliffs all along the coast. We leaped from one to the other and all the while I kept a keen eye out for the trickle of a stream coming down through the rocks from the forest above but I found none. I was exhausted by now. I sat down to rest my mouth dry, my head throbbing. I was racked with desperate thoughts. I would die of thirst. I would be torn limb from limb by the monkeys. Stella's eyes looked up into mine. There's got to be water, I told her. There's got to be. So said her eyes, what are you doing sitting here, feeling sorry for yourself? I forced myself to my feet and went on. The sea water in the rock pools was so cool, so tempting. I tasted it, but it was salty and brackish. I spat it out at once. You went mad if you drank it. I knew that much. The sun was already low in the sky by the time we reached the beach on the other side of the island. We were only about halfway round by now. This place was so much bigger than I had seen from high up on the hill that morning. Despite all my searching, I had found no water, nothing to eat. I could go no further and neither could Stella. She lay stretched out beside me on the sand, panting her heart out. We would have to stay where we were for the night. I thought of going into the forest a little way to sleep on ground under the trees. I could make a nest of soft dead leaves. The jungle floor was thick with them, but I dared not venture in, not with the shadow of night falling fast over the island. The howling had started up again, far away in the forest. Alas, 
mellifluous evening even song, a chanting that went on and on until darkness covered the island. Insects, that is what I presumed they were anyway, whirred and whined from the forest. There was hollow tapping like a frantic woodpecker. There was scraping, scratching and a grunting, grating noise that sounded like frogs. The whole orchestra of the jungle was tuning up, but it wasn't the sounds that frightened me. It was those phantom eyes. I wanted to be as far as possible away from those eyes. I found a small cave at one end of the beach with a dry sandy floor. I lay down and tried to sleep but Stella would not let me. She whined at me in the pain of her hunger and thirst so that I slept only fitfully. The jungle droned and cackled and croaked and all night long the mosquitoes were at me too. They whined in my ears and drove me mad. I held my hands over my ears to shut out the sound of them. I curled myself round Stella, tried to forget where I was, to lose myself in my dreams. I remembered then that it was my birthday. I thought of my last birthday back at home with Eddie and Matt and the barbecue we'd had in the garden, how the sausages had smelled so good. I slept at last. The next morning I woke cold and hungry and shivered and bitten all over. It took me some moments to remember where I was and all that had happened to me. I was suddenly overwhelmed by one cruel reality after another, my utter aloneness, my separation from mum and dad, and the dangers all around me. I cried aloud in my misery until I saw that Stella was gone. I ran out of the cave, she was nowhere to be seen. I called for her, I listened for her, but only the gibbons howled in reply. Then I turned and saw her. She was up on the rocks, high above my cave, half hidden from me, but even so I could see that her head was down. She was clearly intent on something. I clambered up to find out what it was. I heard her drinking before I got there, lapping rhythmically, noisily as she always did. She did not even look up as I approached. That was when I saw that she was drinking from a bowl, a battered tin bowl. Then I noticed something strange upon a flat shelf of rock above her. I left Stella to her water feast and climbed further to investigate. Another bowl of water and beside it palm leaves laid out on the rock and half covered by an upturned tin. I sat down and drank the water without pause for breath. Water had never tasted so wonderful to me as it did then. Still gasping, I lifted aside the tin. Fish! Thin strips of translucent white fish, dozens of them, laid out neatly in rows on the plain palm leaves, and five, six, seven small red bananas. Red bananas! I ate the fish first, savouring each precious strip, but even as I ate, I was looking around me, looking for a telltale trembling of leaves at the edge of the forest, or for a trail of footprints in the sand. I could see none. Yet someone had brought this to me. Someone must be there. Someone must be watching. I wasn't sure whether to be fearful at this revelation or overjoyed. Stella interrupted my thoughts. She was whimpering pitifully at me from the rock below and I knew it wasn't love or comfort she was after. She caught every strip of fish I threw her, snaffled it up in one gulp and waited for the next. Head on one side, one ear pricked. After that, it was one for me, one for her. Her beseeching eyes would not let me do otherwise. The fish was raw, but I did not mind. I was too hungry to mind, and so was Stella. I kept the red bananas all to myself. I ate every single one of them. They weren't at all like bananas back home, but much sweeter altogether, more juicy, more, much more delicious. I could have eaten a dozen more. Once I had finished, I stood up and scanned the forest. My benefactor, whoever he or she was, had to be somewhere close by. I was sure I had nothing to fear. I had to make some kind of contact. I put my hands to my mouth and called out again and again, Thank you! Thank you! Thank you! My words echoed round the island. Suddenly the forest was alive again with noise, a great canoff cacophony of singing and hooting and howling and cawing and croaking. Stella barked wildly back at it. As for me, I felt suddenly exhilarated, elated, ecstatically happy. I jumped up and down laughing and laughing until my daughter turned to tears to my laughter turned to tears of joy. I was not alone on this island. Whoever was here must be friendly. Why else were they of feathers? But why wouldn't they show themselves? They would have to come back for the bowls, I thought. I would leave a message. I found a sharp stone, knelt down and scraped out my message on the rock beside the bowls 
Thank you, I wrote. My name is Michael, I scratched. I fell off a boat. Who are you? After that, I determined to remain on the beach all that day and stay close to my cave and the rock above where the fish had been left for us. I would keep it always in sight so that I would at least be able to see who it was that helped me. Stella ran on ahead of me down into the sea, barking at me, inviting me to join her. I didn't need any persuading. persuading. I plunged and cavorted and whooped and splashed. But through all my antics, she was just cruised steadily on. She always looked so serious when she swam, chin up and paddling purposefully. The sea was calm and balmy, barely a ripple of wave to be seen. I didn't dare go out of my depth. I had quite enough of that for a lifetime. I came out clean and refreshed and invigorated, a new person. The sea was a great healer. My bites were still there, but they did not burn any more. I decided I would explore further along the beach, right to the end if I could, just as long as I could keep my cave in view all the time. There were sh shells here, millions of them, golden and pink, thrown up in long lines all along the beach. Before long I came across what seemed at some distance away, like a flat wedge of rock protruding only very slightly from the sand. Stella was scrabbling excitedly at the edge of it. It turned out not to be a rock at all, but a long sheet of rusted metal. Clearly all that was left of the side of a ship's hull, now so deep in the sand. I wondered what ship it was, how long ago she had been wrecked. Had some terrible storm driven her onto the island? Had there been any survivors? Could any of them still be here? I knelt down in the sand and ran my hand along it. I noticed then a fragment of clear glass lying in the sand nearby, from a bottle perhaps. It was hot to touch, too hot to handle.